Good afternoon and welcome to another Research in Action brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. My name is Karen Scapinado. I work at FAU and I will be today's moderator. Before we get started, this series was created to allow community engagement and tell you all about the interesting projects that our researchers at FAU are working on. With that, we'd love to answer your questions as they relate to today's topic. Um, if you have your mouse in the bottom of your screen, you see a Q&A button there. If you push on that button, a little pop-up will come up and you can type your question there at any time during the presentation or after. We will go through as many questions as we can in today's time. If we run out of time at 2 p.m., we will ask today's presenter to um, uh, answer those questions offline and we will, uh, we will um, post these uh, answers on our website together with a recording of today's presentation at FAU Research in Action. If you Google that, you should be able to find the link. If not, please feel free to contact us. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Jim Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan is the executive director of our Harbor Branch uh, Oceanographic Institute located in Fort Pierce, so north of here. It's our, our northernmost campus for FAU. Uh, Dr. Sullivan has held several senior positions in academia and industry, both as research faculty at the University of Rhode Island and a senior oceanographer for the company Seabird Scientific. Dr. Sullivan's research interests include biological and physical mechanisms that control the spatial temporal dynamics of phytoplankton populations in the coastal oceans and harmful algal bloom. And I'm not going to go through all of his interests because it's a very long list. Um, as executive director, Dr. Sullivan is leading a strategic effort to develop interdisciplinary research by combining expertise across many of FAU centers and colleges. And he is also a state appointed expert on the harmful algal bloom uh, committee. And with that, I'm just going to turn it over to him so he can actually tell you more about harmful algal bloom, something that is very critical to our state here. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Karen. And thanks to everybody who um, showed up today to listen to this. Hopefully, uh, by the end of it, you'll have learned something if I do my job. I'll just start off with, with this title slide. Um, this is not enhanced or photoshopped. This is a shot from the Indian River Lagoon up here um, <clears throat> in, on the Treasure Coast. And this is not what the ocean should normally look like. So hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, you'll better understand why this can happen. So I am just going to give you a, a brief overview of Harbor Branch, just one slide, um, since Karen uh, also brought it up. Harbor Branch is the northernmost campus of FAU. It's up here in St. Lucie County. There are six campuses, FAU, Boca being the main campus. Harbor Branch was actually established 50 years ago in 1971. And it's a pretty large campus. This is an overshot of all the campus. It goes from over here all the way down this is the Indian River Lagoon, so our researchers have quick access to the lagoon, and the Atlantic Ocean is right out here, so we can get out into the ocean pretty quickly, too. We have about 144 acres. There's about 30 buildings on campus, and roughly 200 or so staff and 40 faculty, thereabouts. So we're going to talk about harmful algal blooms. So what are harmful algal blooms, or what we just, in short, say, HABs? They're simply just the occurrences of phytoplankton that cause some kind of negative ecosystem or human impact. And you can see an example of different photographs of different harm, harmful algal blooms here. And the one thing you should notice is, look at all these different colors of the water, just like the slide I showed as my first slide. And we have a lot of different names for harmful algal blooms. We call them red tides, brown tides, green tides, pretty much any color you see, someone might call it that kind of tide. Um, it's just jargon. But why does this happen? Why does the water discolor this way? The phytoplankton or algae color comes from the different pigments in the different species of algae. And just like land plants, that you might have around your yard, well, some of them are red, some are green, same exact thing. They just have different pigments in them. 
And you can see it over here on this picture. These are cultures of pure cultures of different algal species. And you can see some of these exact same colors that you see in nature in these pure species. So what does this tell you? When you see a harmful algal bloom that discolors the water like this, it's a lot of one species. So there's a lot of algae in the water and it's probably mostly just one thing. So what are phytoplankton? They're really simply, you can think about them as microscopic plants. So we commonly call them algae, but they're a little bit different from a regular plant. So here's a close-up shot of a, um, a phytoplankton. This is a dinoflagellate. This scale bar says 50 microns. This is about the width of your hair. So these are mostly microscopic organisms. You can barely see them individually. But as you can see in this movie that's been playing on the side, some of them have very special adaptations. So they're not strictly like plants. They can, a lot of them can actually swim. They have flagella. They're more like protists. So they, they kind of skirt the world between being animals and plants, but they are very much like plants that they have chlorophyll and they conduct photosynthesis. This is how most of them make a living and grow. If an algae can't actively swim like this, a lot of them can control their buoyancy so they can float up and down throughout the water column and go, go up to the surface and then go back down at depth. And they do this, this, this motility is a way for the algae to be more successful. They can come up into the light or they can go down towards the bottom where there's more nutrients. So it allows them to be more successful and, and grow better. So how do these harmful algal blooms actually grow? Well, I just told you they're like plants. So harmful algae, like all plants uh, on land, need three main conditions to grow or bloom. The first thing they need is optimal light. You know, you can't grow a house plant in a dark room. So we all obviously know this about plants. With algae, higher light generally promotes faster growth. So if they get a lot of sunshine, um, certain species can grow pretty fast. And that's one of the reasons you see them right up at the surface. They'll come up there to get that light. They also need an optimal temperature. In general, this isn't always true, but most of the time, warmer temperatures mean faster growth. So if it's hot and the algae can take it, they'll grow really fast. It helps them grow. And that's true of a lot of plants as well. You don't see uh, many farms, agricultural farms being run in the dead of winter. So the colder it is, a lot of algae don't like it, just like land plants. The third thing they need is optimal nutrients. More nutrients that they have, the more biomass you can grow. And biomass is simply a way to say there's more of it. So just like we give nutrients to our house plants and plants in the garden or farmers um, put down fertilizer, which is nutrients onto their plants, algae need nutrients to grow. And primarily those nutrients are nitrogen and phosphorus. So the reason I'm presenting this to you today, unless you've been living under a rock, you probably understand Florida has an algae problem. And I collect these headlines that I, I see all the time. It's almost every summer you'll get a, a slew of these kind of headlines. And you can go through them. Some, a lot of them are national. You get CNN, USA Today. Every time, and it's generally almost every summer now, that we have a large harmful algal bloom event somewhere in the state, it makes national news. That's not good for tourism. Um, it's certainly not good for our marine life. We see a lot of fish, dolphins, manatees, various um, animals suffer when we have harmful algal blooms. Um, it obviously affects tourism, as I said. It may affect our health. Um, this is a, a big question I'll talk about a little bit later. And in general, this just is not something we want to see as residents of the state, that we continually have these kind of problems. This is not just a Florida problem, though. So don't think that, you know, Florida has been singled out and is um, the only place this occurs. This is happening worldwide right now. Harmful algal blooms really appear to be increasing not only where we see them, so their geographical location, but also in the type of algae we're seeing now, the frequency, how often these things occur, the duration, how long they last, and just how bad they are. You know, what impact do they have um, to their local ecology, to humans, whatever. And you can see 
Uh, this is a really simple graph here. These are reported harmful algal bloom occurrences 50 years ago in 1972. And the different symbols are different types of harmful algal blooms. And this is what we see now. And this is, this is pretty, a pretty common year in the United States now. The two things you notice right away is there are a lot more harmful algal blooms that are detected and occur around the United States. And there's a lot of different kind of harmful algal blooms. Here we just had really three things going on. Here we have a litany of lists of different things. And this is this increase in type that we're seeing. The other thing you're gonna notice is Florida has almost every one of these going on at some point. And that's why I say Florida is one of the most have impacted states in the US. You know, we, it's not something we wanna lead in, but unfortunately it seems to be something we're leading in. And you may ask yourself, you know, what's the difference between 1972 and now? Well, one of the big things is the world population has essentially doubled over 50 years. So just think about what stress that puts on the environment. And that's why we get to this slide. Why are these harmful algal bloom events getting worse? So as you can probably guess, if you think about this uh, for any length of time, Number one, nutrient pollution, or what scientists call eutrophication. As humans start to develop land and want to live by the water and do more agriculture because they have to feed themselves, more nutrients get into our watersheds and get into our coastal oceans and lakes and everywhere else. That is nutrient pollution, and it's a significant source of um, or cause for why we're seeing what we're seeing. Second goes along with that, the kind of ecosystem modifications that humans are doing. We're changing land use practices, developing areas for farmland where fertilizer is used. We're developing um, areas of, in the state of Florida, it's obvious, we build houses, we make up, put up parking lots, and we get rid of marshes and areas that might have normally used up the natural nutrients or nutrients that were put into the ecosystem well, now it's hard tar or something else and the water just runs off and it carries these nutrients easily into the watershed. So that's how development and changes in land use practices can uh, exasperate this problem. It causes increased runoff, we do dredging. There's a lot of things we do to the ecosystem and in our environment, which can help these algae um, start to proliferate. Another thing, and again, we're responsible for this, is global warming and climate change. So we're warming the oceans, we're warming the atmosphere, the earth is getting warmer uh, due to CO2 emissions and the greenhouse effect. This warming that we're doing, it can increase the growth rates. I already told you that the warmer water can make these things grow better, but it also can increase the ranges. So harmful algae that maybe live down towards the equator or the Caribbean, they can start moving north and getting into water where it used to be cold and it's not anymore, and now they can persist. And we see this with all kinds of animals, starting you know, a northerly migration. Well, it's true of these algae too. We're starting to give them more and more habitable places to go. So this, this is a problem. Along with global warming and climate change comes changing precipitation. We're obviously seeing more intense storms now. It seems like rainfall is uh, getting greater and greater depending on where you are. More rain means more runoff. More runoff means more nutrients being carried into the water. And again, nutrient pollution is bad for this. Uh, we do, as humans, introduce new algal species into new environments. This was a big deal uh, back in the 70s and 80s, what they call ballast water transport, these large vessels that come across the ocean. They take in seawater from their home port and they use it as ballast. And then when they get across the ocean or wherever they're going, they dump all that ballast water out locally, fill up with cargo and, and go on their way. Well, they've just put an algae potentially from across the ocean into a new area. So humans started to recognize that we were doing this and now they, they treat ballast water quite a bit in these large tankers because we've realized that we've spread algae to areas where they really shouldn't be. And one of the last things that can you know, make these HAB events get worse is with all the changes we're doing to ecosystems, we start eliminating some fish species, which has a cascading effect where we change the primary things that might eat this algae. 
you know, loss of oysters, loss of mussel, loss of juvenile fish that eat algae. And suddenly the predators for harmful algal bloom algae are gone. And these things can proliferate and become a problem. As bad as all that sounds, it's actually been forecast now to get worse. And as bad as it is, the government itself says it's going to become a bigger problem. This is the fourth national climate assessment. This is done by the US government. It was done just a couple of years ago. And the big take home for the Southeast region of the United States was that uh, red tide and algal blooms will become more common in Florida. And again, it comes to this warming of the oceans and everything that comes with it that can help these blooms grow. So how are these algal blooms actually harmful? And I wanna go through this because most people only think about this. They think, oh, the algae is toxic, it's bad, it's gonna make me sick. And that's true, but there's other reasons why these harmful algal blooms that might not even be toxic can really do damage to the ecosystem. And it, it's probably actually worse what these other ones can do. And I'm gonna go through each one of these. So first, the toxins. There are many different types of harmful algal blooms they all, a lot of them have different toxins and they have different effects on the health of humans and wildlife. And you can see here all these different, you know, shapes and sizes of different algae. They all produce different types of chemicals and toxins. And you can be exposed to these toxins in a number of different ways. You can drink contaminated drinking water. A lot of these algae are also in fresh water, so they can get into drinking water supplies. And if we're not careful, their toxins can leach uh, into our water supply and we can get exposed to them. If you're familiar with Florida's red tide and you've been down to any of our beaches when there's a red tide going on, you know about this. These toxins algae produce can actually uh, volatilize and get into the air. So it's noxious fumes and you are literally breathing a toxin. So if it's red tide in Florida, you'll start coughing, your eyes will water, you're not gonna feel good. Um, and you've been exposed to it. And in this case, it's a neurotoxin. You can eat contaminated fish or seafood. Shellfish uh, are typically a way people get exposed to it, but just regular fish sometimes have these toxins in them because they're in the food chain. And lastly, just going in the water where one of these blooms is going on could potentially make you or your pet sick because you're ingesting water through your nose and your mouth accidentally. You're not trying to drink seawater, but it happens. And for pets, it's a, a really big issue. And we see this almost every summer in Florida where someone loses a dog uh, because the dog went into a, where a harmful algal bloom was, it then licked itself and it got a massive dose of toxin. So just this recreational exposure um, can be dangerous. And there's two ways it can affect you. You can get an acute impact where you immediate, have this immediate response and it's typically severe um, to the toxins. And that's like with red tide, you start coughing, you don't feel good, you know right away you're being exposed to something and you get away from it. This is your body protecting you. Same thing when you eat like a contaminated clam, your um, tongue and your lips might get numb. That's your body telling you stop doing this. So you can, your body tries to help you um, from this, but you'll know immediately that, you know, you, you've ingested toxins. The more insidious thing is the chronic impacts. And this is where the response to the exposure to the toxin is only realized over a much longer time. So it could be years. And think about someone who lives on the water and they're exposed to a harmful algal bloom every summer and they get low level sub-lethal sub exposure of some toxin. We don't really know what that's doing. And we need a lot more research in this area because we really don't understand this well. But you see stories like this, um, and this was a couple years ago. Someone looked at uh, non-alcoholic liver disease clusters where it was well above the, the normal um, average we expect for an area. And they compared it to uh, where algal blooms were occurring and four counties uh, in Florida's Treasure Coast made up a cluster with deaths from this non-alcoholic liver disease and algal bloom. And it makes you wonder, this doesn't mean one caused the other. Uh, correlation is not causation, famous saying in science. But you really want to start doing these studies to understand, is, was this the cause? You know, and do we have to really be careful about this? So 
this is a list of all these different types of toxins, and this isn't even comprehensive. There are a lot of toxins we probably don't even know about um, quite yet or have not identified, but this is the most of the common ones we're aware of now. There are, and this is the effects on humans. So we have paralytic algal toxins. These are generally in what we call saxitoxins and the acute effects when you're exposed to them are nausea, paralysis, and even death. And people have died from saxitoxin exposure. We have neurotoxic algal toxins. Again, it's a neurotoxin. This is what Florida red tide is. This is the type of toxin. We call these brevitoxins. And when you're exposed to them, you can have nausea, vomiting, numbness, and respiratory distress, that coughing or really difficult to breathe. Uh, the good thing about that, or not good, but you know, at least um, thankful, I don't know if there's ever been a, a, a verified death due to brevitoxin in humans. This kills millions of uh, animals in the ocean because they're highly exposed to it. They're in the bloom. And we see massive fish kills on the West Coast and dolphins and manatees, turtles, all kinds of animals because they get a high exposure to this neurotoxin and die. So I, I would assume if a, new, if a human had enough of it, uh, they, they would die. But today, I don't think that's actually happened. Um, diuretic algal toxins, this is okadaic acid. This is probably the uh, least important. It doesn't really happen a lot in Florida. We don't tend to get big blooms of the algae that produce this um, type of toxin. And again, it won't kill you, but the acute effects, nausea, vomiting, intense diarrhea, it's gonna make for a, a poor weekend uh, if you get exposed to it. Another thing you can get is amnesic algal toxins. This is domoic acid. Um, this is a really nasty toxin. Its acute effects can cause memory loss, brain damage, and ultimately death in humans and a lot of wildlife as well. Humans have died of domoic acid poisoning. Um, and it's a, a, a real, real significant toxin. It essentially starts giving you dementia and Alzheimer's-like symptoms if you're exposed to it. And there's no recovery from that. Uh, Ciguatera algal toxins. If you eat a lot of fish in the Caribbean, you probably or know people that do. You've probably heard of someone getting ciguatera uh, fish poisoning. These are ciguatoxins. Again, probably won't kill you, but this is uh, not going to be a lot of fun with all these potential uh, symptoms you're going to get when you're exposed to it. And the last one are a, a suite of toxins we call cyanotoxins, and these are created by blue-green algae. These are fre mostly freshwater, but there are saltwater varieties of blue-green algae, and it's a long list of toxins, microcystins, cylindrospermopsins, lingvia toxins, nodularin, uh, just a host of them. And these things can almost, they do everything. It depends on the toxin, but they can be neurotoxic, hepatotoxic, or, or liver toxin, cytotoxic, endotoxic, cardiotoxic, they can hurt your heart. Um, so the blue-green algae are, are particularly nasty um, and the things, the suite of toxins they can produce. So let's move on from that. I think that's what most people think about when they think of harmful algal blooms. But there are far, there are many other things that can happen. And one of them is the high biomass, just the amount of the algae that you get that, that, that grows in the water. So what are the two things it can do? There's two problems. So here's an example of some harmful algal blooms growing as a brown tide, a green tide in this lime green tide um, that just occurred up in the Indian River Lagoon. So normally in a, a healthy ecosystem, the water is relatively clear and you can have seagrass or you could have a coral reef. There's a lot of things that need light that live on the bottom of the ocean and, and live, you know, or down there. So seagrass obviously lives on the bottom. It gets sun, it's a plant, it needs to grow. If you have a harmful algal bloom like this, that sunlight, is not gonna to penetrate to the bottom of the ocean. I mean, it's probably gonna go in about three or four inches into the water and then the light's gonna be gone. It gets absorbed by all this algae. It essentially blocks out the sun or shades out the sun and the seagrass dies. Or if it's happened to a coral reef, corals need light too, the coral reef could die. Um, so, this shading effect is, is pretty important and can have really devastating effects. We've lost a ton of seagrass environment in Florida. 
And as you can imagine, the loss of these seagrass ecosystems around Florida can be devastating to the species that depend on them. Juvenile fish uh, live in seagrass, so it's used as a breeding ground. We have a lot of herbivores, larger herbivores that eat seagrass, like turtles and, of course, the Florida manatee. You can see here chomping on some seagrass. Now, um, many of you have probably been hearing the news this year. This loss of seagrass was one of the contributing factors why we saw a really mass um, death event in manatees. Wasn't the only reason, but it was a, a big contributing factor that essentially there was so little seagrass that they started starving to death. So that harmful algal bloom, even though it wasn't toxic, it wiped out the seagrass, which then hurt the manatee population. So that's how you have this cascade of effects even without toxins. Another thing that can happen when you get these really high biomasses is low or no oxygen conditions in the water or what scientists call hypoxia or anoxia, but it just means there's very little oxygen. You can get nitrogen loading into the water and then this is again, fertilizer. This is the nutrient pollution we're putting in the water and you get a large algae, algal bloom, a lot of biomass. Eventually the bloom does die and it decomposes and it sinks down to the bottom. And when that happens, bacteria, just like on land, um, they rot and, and consume things. Bacterial degradation and consumption uses oxygen. Just like when we breathe oxygen, it gets used as respiration. Well, it uses up all the oxygen in the water and you get this hypoxia or anoxia conditions or very low or no oxygen. And this is happening more and more. We see this along Florida a lot. In 2016, I was actually here for this and, and did a lot of work on this. We had one of the largest fish kills ever reported in the Indian River Lagoon. So this made CNN. This was a shot from that time. All this is dead fish. And this is in a canal up in the northern part of the Indian River Lagoon. And this, as it says, was seen from miles. I mean, you could almost walk across the water. And this was just a, a very low, almost anoxic event, and it wiped out, you know, literally millions of fish. This just doesn't happen in little areas. This is uh, actually quite common now, unfortunately. I don't know how many of you have heard about this, but it's um, something that's made news for quite a few years. There's this thing called the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So what happens here is you have the Mississippi River watershed, which has a lot of agriculture and cities, and that produces nutrients, which eventually drain down the Mississippi and into the Gulf of Mexico and creates you know, these seasonal blooms of algae, which then sink, die, and produce hypoxia or a dead zone where there's just not enough oxygen in the water to sustain life. And this dead zone has grown over time. I mean, it, it's almost the size of some states. I mean, this is really big. And you essentially just start to wipe out the wildlife. And I'd like to say, well, it's just a couple areas in the world where this occurs, but these uh, anoxic, hypoxic zones are kind of spreading around the world right now. And it makes sense. Our population is doubling. Um, we're a developing world and more and more pollution is getting into our oceans, but not without a bad effect. So let's talk about the other, another one. This is mechanical damage that harmful algae can produce. Um, these are things you would never probably think about unless you were an algal biologist, but there's this one particular algae, not toxic. It's a diatom and it has um, a silica shell or glass. And here's a close up of it. And you can see on its, its little CD, these really sharp edges that are like as sharp as a knife. So they're like blades. And these get into the gills of salmon and cut up their gills and essentially kill the salmon. Um, and here's a paper on this, and it can be pretty devastating to the salmon populations. And again, the algae is not particularly harmful other than what it does to these fish. Um, another thing is we have brown tides going on in Florida um, routinely now. Brown tides, a particular algae in, um, that produce brown tides can produce this mucus on the outside of their cell. And normally if you had healthy oysters or mussels or something out in the water, they can take algae filled water like this and absolutely clear it because that's what they eat. They suck in that water and eat the algae. 
But this, these uh, brown tide algae make this mucus that basically prevents the shellfish from feeding. So they clam up and they can actually starve to death. So even though the, the clam should be able to eat it, they don't and they can't. Um, another interesting thing that these red tides can do, and this I was out when this occurred in Monterey Bay, California. Uh, this one, this algae I showed you the movie of in the beginning, it was actually the causative organism. Uh, it's called Akashigo sanguinea. But it produced, again, like the brown tide, this goo that came out of its um, cell. And it was a surfactant that essentially broke down the oil in seabirds' feathers. And if you know anything about seabirds, they can take very cold water because they have this insulating down and they got oil that basically keeps, it, keeps the water out. But if they lose that oil, they're then exposed to very cold water and they die. So they saw a mass stranding of these seabirds and it took a while to figure out what caused it. This was a pretty novel paper that it was actually this chemical that was being, you know, and it's not a toxic chemical, it was being released by this algae. And finally, the last one is economics. And if we look at this, Florida's blue economy is what we consider what we get from the water, what we get from our coastlines, what we get from our lakes and our rivers and the tourism and fisheries and everything that has to do with it. It's 40 billion a year. This is a huge number and a big part of Florida's economy. But these harmful algal blooms can really seriously impact the economics of Florida and other states and, and areas around the world through losses in tourism, fisheries, recreation, property values. I mean, if you're a tourist and you see signs like this, you're not going to stay around in that area very long. You know, if you're a shell fisherman and you can't harvest because the shellfish are contaminated or the fish are contaminated, that's a problem. If you're going to a beach and this is sargassum, which is another harmful algal bloom, unfortunately now, I mean, this is not a beach you're going to want to spend any time on. And if you own a nice house by the water and this is what you see in your backyard, a harmful algal bloom every summer, uh, good luck trying to sell it. You know, this, this can impact in a lot of different ways. And there, people are doing these kind of estimates on, you know, the, the economic costs, and it's in the billions of dollars when we have a bad harmful algal bloom. So what's going on in South Florida right now? Here's a map of South Florida. Uh, Florida's red tide, and that's what this is, Karenia brevis, that produces this brevitoxin. It usually is a, a huge problem on the West Coast. There is a red tide going on right now, right around this area. Um, it occasionally comes around and gets to the East Coast, comes around through the Straits of Florida on the Florida current and comes up here. This happened just a couple of years ago. Uh, microcystis, um, and micro, which produces the toxin microcystin, blue-green algae. Big problem in Lake Okeechobee, but it's also throughout our fresh water in the state. Uh, Ciguatera is Ciguatera poisonings called by, caused by Gambrodiscus. That happens down in the more warmer Keys and Caribbean area, but this might start be one of these that moves north as it gets warmer. Oops. Um, Florida Bay has a, cyano, a saltwater cyanobacterial problem uh, that could be an issue for the coral reefs. This brown tide organism has been up in the Northern Indian River, uh, River Lagoon for, oh, almost five years now. Uh, this is another for probably the past 20 years. It's been a recurrent every summer bloom of pyridinium. This produces this uh, neurotoxin, saxotoxin. Uh, this is somewhat troubling. We are now starting to see, and this is new to Florida, um, this organism called Pseudonychia, which produces this really bad neurotoxin, domoic acid. So we are starting to see it. We're detecting it in marine wildlife, and that, that's not a good thing. And finally, we are seeing um, cyanobacterial blooms up in the northern middle part of the Indian River Lagoon. This is one of the things that causes that loss of seagrass, and it's related to the loss of manatees um, that we see up here. So I'm back to my first slide. Can the damage be undone with all the damage I just described and what might happen in the future? Can we stop this? And the answer is yes. So I gave you all the bad news. I'm going to talk about the potential good news. It is a yes, but it's going to take a lot of time, money, effort, and most importantly, political will to get this done. 
So what is the state been doing? Well, Ron DeSantis, our governor, did name the Florida Blue Green Algal Task Force to deal with this. It was a group of scientists. Um, I'm actually standing here with the governor when he made this announcement. He reconstituted the Red Tide Task Force, and we have a chief science officer for Florida now. We're on our second one. Dr. Mark Raines um, is our second officer. And we've also got a Florida Red Tide Mitigation and Technology Development Initiative going on. So the governor has been trying to get scientists involved with advising the government and the state how to deal with this. And I'm on the Blue Green Algal Task Force for the governor. And it, the question I get asked is, you know, why do we care about blue green, blue green algae? And I, I've kind of explained this, but I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail. This is a shot of Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee is a very large lake if you've been out there. It's almost like a great lake. This is a shot from space. And all this green slick you see covering a good portion of the lake, that's a harmful algal bloom. You can see it from space. It's really big and there's a lot of it. And it's producing a lot of toxin when it occurs. It's been occurring pretty regularly now, every year, every other year. And it has issues. It produces toxins that can hit or hurt humans. And we've been dealing with this uh, persistently uh, it seems like over the last 10 years at least. But this is just not, this blue green algae problem is just not a problem in Lake Okeechobee. So I don't know how many of you are from West Palm or were heard about this, but um, this early spring, late spring, early summer, the West Palm Beach drinking water and Palm Beach drinking water reservoir. Uh, had a bloom, not of microcystis, not of this blue green algae, but another type of blue green algae. And it got into the drinking water. And they basically had to shut down the drinking water to the population of these cities this year, just because this algae got in there. And I've heard they're trying to take measures to uh, avoid a repeat of that. But people were likely exposed to this toxin, and that, that's not a good thing. So we do care about it. Um, so. What is the state doing with the Blue Green Algal Task Force, which if you're curious about this, is a website here. The mission of the task force, as I've written here, is to guide and expedite improvements in regulatory and policy structure to improve you know, the water quality of, of Florida. And we do this through a, a lot of different ways. And five scientists in the state were appointed to this, myself, Evelyn Geiser, Wendy Graham, Mike Parsons, and Val Paul from the um, Smithsonian with Florida's Chief Science Officer, Mark Raines, acting as a chair. So we meet regularly and try to advise uh, the government on what to do. As a task force, we've considered two, two main strategies to address this problem of harmful algal blooms, in particular, the blue-green algal um, blooms. And there's really only two things we can do. There's prevention and mitigation. And mitigation is just how do you get rid of it once it occurs? We've got to do both of these, but the task force as a group does um, agree that, look, if we're going to prioritize where we spend money, we've got to spend money on prevention. If we prevent them from getting bad, we don't have to worry about mitigation. They're not going to occur. So how do we stop algae from growing? Let's go back to the first slides I was showing you. These three things these plants essentially need, light, temperature, and nutrients. We can't turn off the sun, so we're not going to be able to do it by stopping light. We're not going to make Florida cool again uh, in temperature wise, and we're not going to, Florida as a state's not going to stop global warming by itself. So it's really not temperature either. Nutrients are pretty much, and nutrient pollution is the only thing we can control. So all our prevention strategies have to be based on reducing nutrient loads getting into our water. So let's look at that. For nutrient pollution um, caused by mostly humans, and this is for nitrogen and phosphorus, these two major nutrients these plants need. These are the sources in Florida. Septic systems, even the best septic system, if it's operating perfectly, it's leaching uh, nitrogen into the local um, sand and area around it. Agricultural operations, obviously, they fertilize crops, they use biosolids, um, so a big use of nutrients there. Stormwater runoff, you go, you have water that goes into stormwater treatment areas, you see these pond retention ponds all over Florida, 
Some of them work well, some might not. Some might be old and failing and water just goes right through them. Uh, the use of residential fertilizers can run off. Uh, that's why you see fertilizer bans in a lot of counties these days. Uh, sewer spills and overflows. Treatment plants can get overwhelmed during a hurricane and they have to start just dumping essentially untreated water. Uh, failing infrastructure. Florida still has wooden sewer pipes in some areas of the state. Um, and we see these kind of spills um, usually once a year somewhere. Legacy nutrient loads. I mean, we've been dumping nutrients for decades and it makes this muck and the sediments get loaded with it. And even if we stopped all these things, these are still there. And how they recycle back into the, the ecosystem is another uh, issue. And there's a lot of smaller things, herbicide use, reuse water, natural leaf litter. Um, the issue is a lot of people want to point fingers and say, well, if we just stopped all the septic systems in the state, everything would be great. And it's really not that simple, and I wish it was. But the relative importance of these sources in the state really depends, you know, the importance to the pollution depends on the location of the watershed. So here's an example. This is Lake Okeechobee. This is the watershed for it. A uh, lot of agricultural use, There's some urban up by Orlando. But if we look at just the phosphorus load coming from this area, the natural land, leaf litter and things that are, it contributes about 14% of the phosphorus load. The stormwater runoff from these urban areas, about 7%. 80% is coming from, or roughly 80 is coming from agricultural processes. But the issue is, that might be true here, but if I went over to the Indian River Lagoon, it might be totally opposite. It might be septic systems or stormwater runoff. So you can't just say, if we do one thing, it's gonna cure what goes on in the state. We have to look at it holistically and really address all of these simultaneously. So what is the state doing? Uh, just to, in a, a quick summary, there are multiple task force, forces providing science-based recommendations on policy management regulations. There is water quality improvement legislation being done. We see increased uh, harmful algal bloom monitoring and toxin testing. I've seen an increased cooperation between state agencies. The Florida Department of Health has been investing in HAB and human health studies. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection has been investing in science and technology. And there's been an increased public education outreach and warning signs put up. And here's an example of that. You can get the Blue Green Iowa Task Force weekly update emailed to you. There's new signage that the task force worked on to be put around the state. You can look at the sampling status of blooms. This is the Red Tide Update website. There's a lot of information available to the public to, to see what's going on in their neck of the woods in their water. So the task force itself sent a bunch of recommendations up to the governor after we met in the legislature. And the governor is trying to follow um, some of the recommendations we've given. And last year, the governor signed the Clean Waterways Act, which contained a number of issues the task force had said to address. Um, one of those was creating the stormwater um, technical advisory committee, which the task, our task force just um, worked with. And last year, there was another one of these bills went in to further the work that was done by the Clean Waterways Act. This actually got held up in appropriations, and this is where it gets to that political will. If we want all these things to get done, the public has to force um, the government into doing it. What is Harbor Branch doing? We started the Florida Center for Coastal and Human Health, and this is an FAU2 where we use our partner and science expertise to address the HAB crisis in whole, not just individual blooms, to understand what it's doing to the population health of humans and animals, and ultimately work towards a healthy environment and a po uh, healthy population. And the way this center works is we go out and sample blooms, we look for biological indicators and in, you know, toxins in animals. Uh, we use latest techniques like remote sensing with satellites to track blooms. We do real-time water quality monitoring. We look at human health and ecosystem health and all this data feeds back into the center for modeling, risk assessment and telling our stakeholders like the local counties and uh, government agencies and hopefully influencing policy so that it feeds back that we have improved ecosystem and human health. And we established this in 2000, 
18 uh, from very generous seed funding donation from the Harbor Branch um, Oceanographic Institute Foundation. And not only do we get some uh, internal money to do this, but our researchers have been working hard to get external money now that they can um, work together. We recently got money from the Department of Environmental Protection to look at algal blooms in Lake Okeechobee, from the Depart Florida Department of Health to look at health effects and harmful algal blooms, and a lot of other agencies. So it's really starting to bring money in to deal with this problem, which is great because you need money to do science. Uh, the center is doing a lot of research, looking at how toxins are getting into the food chain, looking at different toxins that are out there, or, you know, what's their distribution, what uh, algae are there. And the critical thing is actually starting to publish all this research so that we can start, uh, other scientists can use this as a base to understand uh, what's going on. So my final slide is, what can you do to help? So I've told you kind of in the beginning what you know the state's doing and what FAU and what Harbor Branch is doing, um, and it's not complete. We're nowhere near done, uh, but we're slowly trying to chip away at the problem. But as the public, you've really got to try not to forget about this problem during the off season. There are times when we don't have algal blooms, generally in the winter, but that doesn't mean you can just forget about it because it's going to come back. They come back almost every year. As such, you need to educate yourself and understand your risks to yourself, your family, your pets. Um, if you're going into the water and you might, you might wonder, is that water safe? A little education and looking around, you can understand and, and hopefully be safe uh, in your activities. This is really critical. You need to pressure your representatives. Talk to your senators, talk to your reps, talk both at state and federal. Demand they take action to clean up our water and, and improve our water quality and demand funding to fight the problem. Because I'm gonna tell you, research is very expensive. We almost have to go on the street corner and beg for money. Um, that's why I put this up there. Anything you can do to support the scientists to actually have the time to work on this problem is critical. And with that, I will take your questions. Thank you very much, Jim. And as Dr. Sullivan was uh, saying, just to plug in here uh, and, and expand to it, um, while we are getting some external funding for these, uh, this research and other research uh, uh, projects, um, they usually take a very long time, and I don't know if everybody's aware of that. So if you're submitting a grant today, you may hear in a year or so whether or not you get funding. Typically, you don't get funding right away, so you resubmit, and then you have wait another year to see if you get funding. By that time, you know your research is kind of like on hold because, as uh, Jim was saying, research costs money. So, you know, if you have the ability and interest to help, please let us know. With that, I'm going to go to our questions here. Um, so the, the biggest question, Jim, is how can an, inv an, how can an individual help? Uh, you mentioned the fertilizers, um, but a lot of the causes that you mentioned are really on a broader scale, like ag agricultural and, and so the sewage system, uh, the septic. Um, so how can an individual make a real impact here? Well, it may seem like it's a small thing, but you know, do, and it's not just nutrient pollution, but it's a big thing with the algal blooms, but we have plastic pollution and other things. Be kind to your environment, your small action. If enough people, you know, didn't use fertilizer when they shouldn't, you know, and they didn't, the counties didn't have to ban people from doing it. Try to minimize your footprint when it comes to throwing fertilizer down on the ground or do it in a very responsible way, because it adds up, you know, if a hundred thousand people do that in the state, that's a lot less tons of potential nutrients getting into the water. So it may seem like a small action, but that helps. Honestly, the, the, one of the best things people can do besides, you know, try not to minimize your pollution is putting pressure on politicians. None of this is going to get fixed without political will. They will put the money into it. They will invest in doing it. But if people don't demand change, it's not going to happen because it is expensive. It's really expensive. But if we don't do it, we're going to destroy our environment. You know, we all have to live here. And it's going it, to, we're already seeing the major problems it's causing. So I, I can't stress that enough. You know, keep pressure on your elected officials. 
Coming back to the fertilizers for a minute, Jim, um, do you have an alternative to the common fertilizers that are being used that cause the algal bloom? Um, honestly, go to hardscape or go to, go to things that, you know, you don't have to have a grass lawn, but you know, most of the time you don't really need to fertilize your lawn. <laughs> I mean, most of the lawns in Florida will do just fine without fertilizer. Um, and if it starts to go, well, try to replace it with something that doesn't require fertilizer. There's a lot of people who do that, you know, that, that don't over fertilize and want a perfect lawn. A perfect lawn is costly for a lot of reasons <laughs> to a homeowner, um, but it can have an environmental impact. You know, and another thing is, if you know you have another example, but it costs money, if you have a degraded septic system, you know it's failing, it's not working well, maybe investing in actually, you know, having it upgraded or going into advanced treatment options, uh, which might get rid of a little bit more than nitrogen you're producing. That's a good investment too. Good suggestions. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the impacts of harmful algal bloom on the livestock? Um, yeah, this it's, I, I don't know how much research has been done on it. And when you say livestock, I assume you're talking about cows um, and larger, larger animals, horses potentially. Uh, I have heard anecdotal evidence that there was an issue with some of the, the ponds that are used for um, uh, both drinking water for cows, because they'll go up and they'll drink, but it's also used as uh, irrigation they can actually have blue-green algal blooms in them and often do. I mean, blue-green algae is in every freshwater body that's out there. It's whether it's at a, a toxic version or it's at enough of it to be a problem. But cows can drink this contaminated water and get sick just like any other animal. But it can also be irrigated. And there, there are studies showing that microcystin, this particular toxin from blue-green algae, can be taken up into plants. So... If that's mm -hmm. true, it is just like we can eat contaminated seafood, they could be eating contaminated grass or you know, a crop, whatever it is. There has not been a ton of research on that. I'm still not you know, 100% sure that's going on. But if they drink contaminated water that's on a farm, yeah, they're gonna get sick. That, that in extension could even affect humans, right? I mean, if it actually goes into plants, even if you're vegetarian, right? If it goes into crop, I, I didn't want to say that, but um, yes, if, if irrigation is coming out of a heavily laden, you know, pond that's got a ton of blue-green algae in it, you wonder if it's taken up by plants, is it getting, because we produce a lot of fruit and vegetables in Florida, mm -hmm. you know, is, could that possibly happen? Again, I, I mean, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And there is no research being done currently. Not, in that not that I, I mean, there is some, but not a lot. No. Yeah. Yeah, still a lot of areas that we need to cover with our research. Um, here's a question about the Palm Beach uh, drinking water and which cyanobacteria affects uh, that water. So that was, um, it, the toxin was cylindrospermopsin and it was a species of cylindrospermopsis, um, which is very different from the normal blue-green algae we see in the state, which is Microcystis organosa. And kind of the, the tricky thing about uh, cylindrospermopsis is that it doesn't make this highly visible bloom. If you were to walk out to the reservoir, you'd probably not notice at all that it was there because it doesn't float on the surface. It tends to sit near the bottom of the lake. So you might have, you can't visually say, oh, there's a bloom, you know, that's dangerous water. If you're not out there sampling it and sampling in the right spot, you're not even going to know. Eventually, you'll know because someone will detect it in the drinking water. Um, but that, you know, totally different species. And that's true of a lot of harmful algae. Most people think, oh, well, I'll see the water will be discolored. I'll know it's there. I'll know not to go in. That is not always true. Water can look blue and still have, you know, significant amount of toxin in it. Because and that actually is not is really toxic and it doesn't have to be at a high density and it doesn't sit on the surface. So uh, that's, that's the scary part. You can't always visually tell that it's there. 
And Jim, that actually gets us to a couple of the next questions here. We're having some open water uh, swimmers here, but then also in general, how where, where, do, where can we go to figure out if the water has been measured, what the current status is of algal bloom, algae bloom in uh, in the water? If you if I was to go on the beach and wanted to go swimming, how do I know that it's high at the moment? Uh, you know, and and how do you determine that? How often is the ocean water actually being measured? Well, and it's, I will say right up front, again, I get to that money issue. It is really expensive to do water quality, water toxin monitoring. Think about it. Someone's going to go out there almost every day, take multiple water samples, cart them back to the lab, do these expensive analysis, hopefully get it done within a day because it doesn't do any good to find out three days later the water is poisoned, um, and then get it out and report it to the public so they know. That's a lot of steps and a lot of work to do. Now the state does have good, I try to you know, promote that. They do have websites now where you can look at the most recent samples, what was sampled for, what they found. A lot of the major areas like Lake Okeechobee and some of our major beaches will be sampled on there. And certainly for like red tide on the West Coast, they do a pretty good job of that. Um, and when they find a problem, they'll go out, FWC will go out and sample and report it. So you've really got to start looking at the state websites for this. So if you do a simple search on Google on you know, Florida, uh, harmful algae reporting, whatever, you will find these websites. And I showed screenshots of those during my talk. So if you kind of educate yourself, you might not find your particular pond or beach you want to go to, but you might. And you know, hopefully that'll tell you something. You also got to hope that the local department of health or the county has put up signage. You know, mm -hmm. we as the task force really tried to hammer, um, you know, that this was critical, that not everyone, you know, looks at the web and not everyone's keeping track of this. Get signage up to warn people, you know, before they go in the water. I want to very quickly come back to the question of what can you do as a public and as an individual. And there is actually a study that coming out of FAU's College of Nursing, uh, where they're uh, helping uh, researchers with long-term effects, <clears throat> excuse me, in creating a biorepository. And the public can participate in, in that study. So if you're interested in participating, please send me an email, send us an email, and we'll get you in touch with that group. We're almost out of time here. Um, Jim, I'm going to ask one more question. Uh, I know we have a number of other questions. We will ask Dr. Sullivan to answer the questions, the remaining questions offline, and then post the uh, answers on our website to look out for FAU research in action. Jim, the, next, the last question here is on retired septic systems. Do those get removed or simply filled in and left in place? I don't actually, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> Next at the next task force meeting, I will actually ask the DEP. That is a good question. I yeah, know. because the the concern is if they are being left in place, uh, they're they could just going to keep on spewing nutrients until it exactly. burns yeah. out. Yeah, great. That's a great question. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim. We're out of time, uh, so we'll ask you to answer the remaining questions offline and post the answers on our website. Thank you, everybody, for calling in. We hope to see you next week again. Have a great day. Bye. Mm -hmm.